the last part of the brain stem we'll be looking at is the midbrain before that up till now the clinicals that we have discussed mostly involve ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke of the part of the brain stem from medulla we have the medial medullary syndrome lateral medullary syndrome for pons we have pontine hemorrhage midbrain similarly you will have the webers and benedicts all involve a compromise in the blood supply so what I want to do is give a small overview of how this actually occurs and what is actually happening in the brain stem or brain during that period. So if you see the model in front of you, let us first focus on the brain stem right here. I'm going to basically hide a bit of the brain right here so that everything is more clear. I'm hiding the left cortex as well as the white matter to make everything more clear. And just for good measure, let's also hide the cerebellum on the back. If you remember, down below we had the medulla obliganta, which had two vertebral arteries, not visible here. The vertebral arteries combined to form your basilar artery. And then the, from the basilar, we have the posterior cerebral artery. They've made this transparent just to make other things clear. But if you can just see over here, you can see the posterior cerebral artery and this will then communicate with the middle and anterior cerebral artery via this communicating artery. This right here, this thick artery is the middle cerebral artery. You can see it easily labeled here. And the one in front is your anterior cerebral. Here you can see the label. The anterior cerebral as you can also plainly see is communicating with each other via the anterior communicating. And this is giving your characteristic circle of villus. And notice how the midbrain, right over here, it forms a close proximity with this circular villus. But the point that I wanted to make was that anywhere along this entire length, if you have any blockage or destruction of the artery, this will cause compromise to the blood supply. In this example, what we are seeing is a hemorrhage of the region of the <coughs> Uh, basal ganglia. From the middle cerebral artery, these are your lenticostriate arteries. You can tell by the name, lenticostriate, to supply basically the striatum and lentiform nucleus. Let's compare the two sides just to see the difference. Over here, and let us hide this. Here you can easily see several nuclei. In the middle you have the corpus callosum. From there, we'll go to the right ventricle, which is, lies within, between the caudate and the corpus callosum. And here we have the caudate. And look how they're in perfect symmetry and in line together. As we go further on, we'll have the internal capsule and then the insula. But on the left side, the left side of this model, right after the corpus callosum, you can see how the caudate nucleus is compressed here and the hemorrhage portion showing the internal capsule is deviated further away. The reason being is because in this region we have a hemorrhagic infarct. One of these arteries has been disrupted and I believe it's this one right here. You can see there's a disruption in the artery which causes blood to leak out into this space and since this is all an enclosed area, all that blood accumulating is going to cause pressure to these structures, pushing them away, a hematoma. So this is what really happens. This is the case of hemorrhagic. In case of ischemic, what would happen is that due to the obstruction, there is a lack of blood supply and the arteries would thin out and it would lead to a darkening of the area. Both ischemic and hemorrhagic appear differently on MRI depending upon the contrast used. But in far as the brainstem is concerned, for medulla, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, you either have medullary syndrome lateral or medial depending upon which is involved. For medial it was the vertebra and for the lateral it was the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. For the pons it's mostly the basilar and the pontine branches and as we go up ahead let us now finally look at the midbrain. What we're going to do is draw the midbrain at two levels inferior colliculus and the superior colliculus. Step one is to first draw the characteristic shape and 
what we do is we draw the crust cerebri, the tegmentum and the tectum with two bulges at the back. Some students they prefer to give this appearance the frog-like appearance. You can call it whatever you like. We can divide the crust cerebri and the te tegmentum by making a small band of substantia nigra. Needless to say, this is an important part of the diagram and must be drawn. These two bands referred to are the substantia nigra. While the two bulges at the back, just make two oval structures and we'll label them as the inferior colliculus. Let's start labeling this. <coughs> Top part is the tectum, middle part is the tegmentum, and the one at the bottom is the crust cerebri. The crust cerebri is the part where, through which you have passage of the descending fibers, the corticospinal and the corticobulbar. And that part is further divided into three portions. The one in front is the frontopontine, lateral uh, one most is the lateral pontine, and in the center you have your corticospinal and corticobulbar. And for substantia nigra, since nigra means black, darkish black, let's give it a little added blackness. In your paper, obviously you'll be using blue pens or black pens, so you can demarcate this with just filling it in with the blue pen. And here we have labeling substantia nigra. This is your inferior colliculus. The inferior colliculus <coughs> receives the afferent from your cochlear nerve and it will send these fibers to the medial geniculate body of the thalamus via the inferior brachium. When we do the sound pathway later, there will be a few steps in that. The only other nerve at this region, at the level of inferior colliculus, is the trochlear nerve. And let's use the let's use a different green color just to denote. It fibers start from the front, and by the way, at the center, there must be a cerebral aqueduct. The communication between the third and the fourth ventricle. Make just a star-shaped cerebral aqueduct, and from here on, we'll draw the trochlear nerve. And this is the only nerve which comes from the back side and decussates. Starts from the front, goes to the back and decussates. And after the decussation, it will go forward to supply the superior oblique muscle. Here is the trochlear nerve. And the blue, we have the cerebral aqueduct. finish off a few other structures that we can draw here just to add Although if you've drawn these structures this is the main stuff but to give a little extra added in the center make a crisscross of fibers these are basically the decussation of the fibers of the superior, pedun <coughs> superior peduncle of the cerebellum meaningly the spinal cerebellar tracts which cross at this region decussation at the superior peduncle and last but not least the most important structure and this is the thing that every uh, reviewer examiner will look for you need to draw the collection or the gathering of all the tracts at the side the collection we refer to as the lemonisci and we've touched upon this there are multiple lemonisci spinal trigeminal and uh, there are various lemenisci uh, that they meet at this point. What you do is, you can divide this lemenisci group into four different parts. And you can label them to the side, each part. We have the medial lemenisci, we have the spinal lemenisci. By the way, the medial lemenisci was the posterior column tracts, which were meeting at the nucleus fasciculus and nucleus uh, so nucleus cuneatus and nucleus gracilis. Spinal lemenisci is your spinothalamic tract, anterior and lateral. We have the trigeminal lemeniscus. And we have the lateral lemeniscus as well. 
lateral meniscus involves the pathway of the sound. The only difference at this level, at the level of the superior colliculus, are two things. You'll have everything else, but the only difference is that we erase the trochlear nerve. There's not going to be any more trochlear nerve. And it's a bit of a mess, but it's for the clarity. And the other difference is that in the center right here, although you will have these decussations, you will draw two structures. Number one, we will draw the oculomotor nerve, which comes out through the interpeduncular area right over here. This is your interpeduncular fossa. It's perforated due to the presence of vessels. So two oculomotor nerves and in the center we will draw two big red red nucleuses. The red nucleuses are labeled because of the presence of iron in them. And if you remember, they were part of the rubrospinal tract, the extrapyramidal tract, which were facilitating your flexors. And this is the only thing, and you just label this top part as superior colliculus. This is your brainstem in a nutshell. Next time we'll review everything we've done up till now, from spinal cord to the tracts till the brainstem more specifically we'll be looking at the tracts themselves and how they're passing all the way from spinal cord through the brainstem and up above.